Welcome to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Your host tonight is the author of the pro-black compendium and Zuberi and the Maroons of Ma'a, the Pan-African nationalist Oni. Oni, what are we discussing tonight? All right, peace, 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 family. They say all, all good things must come to an end. And this is the conclusion to the open secret to white domination. All right? The, or the white do- global dominance. I hope you've been enjoying it because I've been enjoying it. I took a little bit of a break, uh, but you can't even tell because I'm recording this on October 6th. Uh, who knows what happened in between time? I don't at this point of recording, but I wanted to give you this, all right? I wanted to record this, give it to you, and just join you in the chat room. I Hopefully hopefully you saw from the first part that I was in the chat room live and active, and hopefully you saw me continue that in all these other parts. This is what it's about, you know? Uh, we'll probably go back to regular scheduling uh, next week. But for this week, I want to remind you that I'm a part of a podcasting network. And if you haven't saw, I've been actively engaging in other channels as well. So check those channels out as well. But check this out. This is D-Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro-Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. Okay. All right, fam. You ready? So we're going to go right back into this book. As you know, we're reading The Wealth of Nations, particularly the preface or the preamble. They say it's the introduction, but it's not really the introduction. I've been reading some of the book. It's actually pretty good. You know, it's pretty good. Uh, You learn quite a bit about Wazungu and how he thinks he has quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of statements that he explains but that kind of put down african people and that's a good thing it's not good for us as african people but again you know you want to generally speaking put down other people and push yourself up you know that is the way that is a subtle way for social control and it's a, it's an underutilized it's underutilized by us but its utilization is very critical, you know? I was actually talking to this brother earlier, um, and I said to him, uh, you know, like if you, if you really study how white people are, you know, they go to, like let's say in a French-speaking country, like a Francophone country like Senegal or something. They go to Senegal, and they put up schools for their school children. Okay, they put up schools for their school children or for the people that they want to labor for them. And when they teach history, they teach French history because they're French. You know, they don't go to Senegal, set up schools for their labor or for their children and teach Senegalese history. And whereas we may, from our perspective, say, well, why don't you, well, I'm an African, you should teach me Senegalese history, you shouldn't teach me about Normandy and so on and so forth, you know, it doesn't really add up as to why somebody who convinced of their own right to educate other people wouldn't share their own history or their own education. You you get what I'm saying? So, you know, sometimes you want to look at the world from the perspective but from multiple perspectives, I mean, sure, you might still say, hey, well, it's wrong for Africans. To, yeah, you could say that, but you have to understand the why, you know? Why would a people go into another country and teach them something they don't even know? You know, what's the value of them being teachers if they don't even know what they're teaching? 
And then, of course, you know, you would put down other people and put up your own people. Or not even necessarily that, but you might say, well, we're going to teach that our people did X, Y, Z, and your people didn't do X, Y, Z. And why are you teaching that? Because you want them to labor for you. You want them to strive towards what you want. You know? Uh, similarly, I saw this uh, other quote, you know, and it's by this uh, American scholar uh, named Amos Wilson, and he's saying... Uh, schools imagine if schools were to teach us how to create jobs you know and 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 it and it 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 again goes back to that same theme of if you're trying to like if you're going to landless people or your landless laborers right what are you going to teach them in order that their children were are, are landless laborers too because the whole point of you building this school as an industrialist or as a as a government or whatever that you're, whoever's building the school is to have these landless laborers also their children be landless laborers. You do not want to teach people to be your competition. You know what I mean? You don't want to teach you want to teach people to be your consumers. You want to teach people to be your labor. You don't want to teach people to be uh, producers, and you don't yeah you don't want them to teach, teach them to be your competition. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you build your own schools, then of course you would teach them what you want to teach them. But even then, you know, you have to be realistic and ask yourself, if you incur the cost of building these schools, right, at the profit gained through labor, right, do you not want more labor? You know? Uh, and I mean, of course, a lot of us will say, no, we don't want more labor, Right. Uh, although labor is an important part of the world, right? You might say, oh, yeah, we don't want more labor. And that's that's fine and good. And it reminds me of this actual, this African proverb. Well, I mean, this African, this African idea, which is that if the master teaches what is truth, uh, the disciple's submission is a nobleman. Whereas if the master teaches, I believe, like lies, maybe, then the disciple's submission is slavery, right? And And the thing is that you know, when I used to discuss this in my uh, organization, right, there was this one brother who said, it's, it's like if you had a martial artist, right? If you're a 20 year old and your martial artist and your martial arts expert is 40, then in 20 years, you should be able to beat your martial artist, I, you know, the, the master, right? But if you, if you can't beat them after 20 years, then they were pretty much lying to you and they're keeping you in slavery. But, you know, it kind of touches on that same theme of, well, if you are teaching people to surpass you and overcome you, right, that might sound good. But if you're trying to maintain power, then maybe not. And whereas you might say, hey, well, look, I'm not trying to maintain power. I'm trying to share power. You probably, you probably believe that for all intents and purposes. You have to realize that Wazungu, in his interaction with you, is not trying to share power. You know, you, you don't travel to Senegal from France to share power with Senegalese people. You know, you don't uh, build a school in Manhattan to share power with a bunch of proletariat children. You know, you don't want your child to share power. So, so it's really important. Now, uh, obviously how we would do it in Africa is very different and it's worth its own conversation, but we're gonna jump right into the literature and I just gotta whet your appetite, right? Uh, I actually got to be quick because if for those of you who don't know or haven't heard, you probably should have heard it by now. I am going to be on the uh, Revolutionary Matron podcast. Uh, at, we're going to discuss the chord noir. Um, I'm recording this right now at seven o'clock. Uh, that's supposed to be starting at 10 o'clock. So I'm going to try to wrap this up and, you know, get ready for that. And that's going to be good. I know it's going to be good. So if you haven't checked it out, make sure you check it out. Make sure you've subscribed to like you had. You've had a couple of weeks now, so if you didn't check it out yet, that's that's on you. But uh, that was that was a good. That's gonna. I already know it's gonna be good. All right. All right. So, anyways, let's go. So the only images of Smith that we have to date from the final years, as well. Wait, the only images of Smith that we have date from his final years, as well. Okay. The best known images were those produced by James Tassie, 1735 to 1799, the Scottish gem engraver and modeler. In 1787, Tassie produced two splendid medallions of Smith. One depicts Smith in a bag wig, 
the style of the day, and the other shows Smith in the antique manner, in the guise of a Roman. The, all right, so this, this is actually pretty important, too. So one, there's two things here. One is that there's only so many images of this guy, and this is after he uh, writes one of the one of these big books, you know, 1787, right? So because he wrote this classic, they're like, okay, we're going to immortalize you, or we're gonna, you're going to have your image taken. Today, we just take an image of anybody and anything. You know what I mean? Like, we could take an image of a banana, you know? Like, like legit, we would take pictures of lunch now. But once upon a time, it was like, you know, with the exception, like, for, I'm not saying painters didn't paint bananas or anything. But uh, for the most part, you know, this guy would go through his whole life and, uh, and like, have no images of him. You know? Whereas, you know, you know, you have a picture of you as a child and you, you know, like, you, you, you probably didn't write a bestseller just yet. Um, I mean, if you did, you know, kudos, you know, like, you know, cool, cool story, bro. Uh, anyway, um, the other thing is this, that this is 1787 and they have two different styles. You know, the style of the day is a bag wig or whatever. But the other style is the antique manner in the guise of the Roman. As to say that they're giving this guy to like, like to, to prop him up for respect. They're giving him that Roman look, you know. Or that's just something that they do as for among their people say, hey, you know what? You would have been something among the Romans, you know? That's, and that's like, a, a like if, if I'm thinking about it for Kemet, like that's actually a pretty respectable compliment. But we don't even do that, you know? I mean, there is exceptions, obviously, in traditional African societies. You do kind of, you know, I don't want to say the word deify, but you do kind of memorialize, you know, people who do great. And you kind of put them in the canon, you know. That's another thing that we actually do now. But we, what we do today is not so much that. Uh, by the way, somebody did listen to my first podcast because I'm recording this before my second podcast came out, and they were like, "Hey, Oni, it sounds like you just want to be." Nah, it's not about me. It's really about. Uh, it's really about. Do we have? Do we even have the community, like this person had? You know, do we even have the community like this person had? And, and I mean the community independent of Wazungu. I mean, there are quite a few black studies people who are big in black studies, you know? Uh, but again, or even like there are quite a few schools of thought, you know, economics and so on and so forth, science, politics, and they're big in their little niches. But this is not big in your little niche. You know what I mean? This is not big in your little niche. This is big among everybody, among the elites and the commoners which is something that's uh, like worthwhile. Um, uh, it's like it's like how we kind of like, like in the, in the black community, it's like, uh, or the black community in America, it's like Cardi B and Megan. But instead of, you know, for, for dancing or singing, it's for political, philosophy, like political thoughts and economic models, you know? Uh, that's, that's, that's a huge difference. Like, uh, yeah, like celebrities. That's what I mean. Celebrities. Uh, like we have it for entertainers, but not necessarily for thinkers. Okay. Um, and yeah. And I mean, for those of you who are thinking about what Malcolm X said, somebody might even have written it. But um, Malcolm X was like, hey, you know, only in the black community do we have entertainers and scholars, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's it. Because at the end of the day, if like these are the people with the, the most popularity, these are the celebrities. You know, you're not going to, like in those days, for, for regards white people, this guy is the bestseller, right? Uh, Adam Smith is the bestseller. So they might even ask him about entertainment news, you know, if they wanted to. Like, like if they're going into different interviews, they might be like, hey, who's your favorite singer? Or who's your favorite, you know, why are they, at, like, so just the same as when they go to an entertainer, they're going to ask them about polit political news because people want to know. People are curious about the celebrities. But it's a question of who do you make celebrities, you know? Who are the celebrities among you? That's, those are the questions. And do we have a community where somebody could be a celebrity among us? You know, technically there is, uh, like I said, there's there's channels like there was a channel. I don't want to say its name really, but Saw Netter. I never watched it personally. I mean, I think I watched it like maybe like last year for like a second because I was like, I think I want to do a debate program. And somebody said, hey, that's Saw Netter. And I was like, really? I had no idea. But yeah, that's that's what it is. And and apparently, you know, you could be a celebrity on that. You know, there's quite a few people who are 
uh, breakaways from that. Uh, so that is technically a community. Uh, but of course, you know, like I said, like the content wise, it's more so historical debates, maybe, you know, oh, is Islam better or is it American spirituality as opposed to how to formulate and form a, 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 a culture, a, 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 an economy. Um, like, like, like I said, I started reading into this uh, book and it's, it's pretty insightful for its time, you know? Uh, and, and if you were to compare it to like a debate uh, or like any of the, com- like most of the commentary of today, you would say, yeah, I'd prefer the book, you know, notwithstanding the bigotry, you know what I mean? <laughs> like notwithstanding. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. Uh, one depicts Smith in a bag wig and anything about so on and so forth. The Edinburgh caricaturist John Kay, 1743 to 1826, drew Smith twice, once in 1787 in a scene which Smith makes... Which, in which Smith makes his way to the Custom House, and then again in 1790 as the author of The Wealth of the Nations. The two other early Smith portraits are almost certainly posthumous and are by unknown artists who might have known him. All later depictions derive from these few. Adam Smith's death on 17 July 1790, The Wealth of Nations continued... No, after Smith's death... On 17 July 1790, the Wealth of Nations continued to attract readers with different people in different times and places reading Smith in different ways. Immediately following Smith's death, the Wealth of Nations became a central text of the French Revolution, 1789 to 1799. And remember that too, the revolution that they fought was for 10 years. You know, the Americans also fought for a good amount of years too. Uh, I forgot how many numbers, but... uh, yeah, like, like, you remember that you, when you're fighting for a transformation of the government, it's not something that you're going to do via typing. And it's not something you're going to do very quickly, per se. Not to say that those coups are not very quick, right? And they are. Uh, so there's a lot of coups that you could do that are pretty fr- freaking quick. I'm not going to front. But, uh, but like, you, you also want to pay attention to the human effort involved. You know, the Haitian Revolution was very long. The, the, the fight that the Maroons took were very long, like 12 years, 10 years. Uh, the, this, is, this is the normalcy. And if, if, if you're not willing to put 10 years of your life or risk 10 years of your life, you know, because a lot of people do not survive revolutions. If you're not willing to risk 10 years of your life, uh, then, like, don't even use the word revolutionary. Uh, don't even use the word revolution. Like, a lot of people I call nevolutionaries. I just say nevolutionaries because they're, they're never going to do it. Actually, I got that from Adam Raffo, though. He says it. Uh, he said it first, as far as I know. Uh, he said it before me. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people are, uh, are nevolutionaries. All right, so Death of Wealth of Nations became the central text of the French Revolution, circulating in a translation of the fourth edition produced in Paris by Jean-Antoine Roucher, 1745-1794. to 1794. See, so pay attention to that. So the French Revolution is from 1789 to 1799, a central text of the Wealth of Nations. Uh, it was produced by this guy in 17... But he was born... But he died in 1794, so he died halfway through the revolution. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's the reality. Like, 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 you have to contribute to the revolution at your own risk. But, but you have to be serious. What is it that you want from a revolution? And what's interesting here, too, is that this is a text. They said a central text of the French Revolution. So this is a text that's going to formulate and, and making a new, like, like bringing a new future. You see what I'm saying? Uh, again, I want to highlight to people, because sometimes you might not have heard my entire catalog, so I definitely encourage you to look back and listen. But one of the things I would say, and I think I mentioned this in the solution, uh, Solutions, uh, I want to say Summit, uh, that was hosted by the Revolutionary Matron. Um, but the way of the world is this, that revolutions or wars or battles, anything, everything is won and lost or what have you, but it's the, it's the, the idea that war doesn't determine who's right, but who's left, right? And the way, if you understand to what, Toussaint's vision of Haiti was versus Dessalines versus Petion's versus Christophe. All four of them had a different vision as to what the ending would be. If, if, Fran- if Haiti, if Toussaint had his way, 
if Haiti would have been a Catholic colony, okay? A colony still with slavery, all right? Uh, or maybe without slavery, but again, it's hard to tell uh, because a lot of people were just kind of reduced back to forced labor or poor labor or whatever, right? You juxtapose that to what Dessalines was hoping for, which was an empire of liberty, and there would be no state religion. There would be no Catholicism. Uh, if anything, it would be an indigenous religion, right? Uh, and then, of course, you check that, check that back with Petion, who was this uh, mulatto, I guess. And what he would think is, uh, you know, like a, like a Haiti that was more leaning towards France uh, versus Christophe, who was more so for independence. But all of their visions were different in their vision. But what kind of, what would have helped or what health in the French Revolution is to have a central text or to have a dialogue, to have a discourse so that people can agree on certain things, certain principles, you know? Like the entire Haitian Revolution was kind of like, yeah, let's not have slavery. Let's not have slavery to the French, right? And, and there's going to be some discussion and discourse on that. You know, some of the mulattoes or mixed people or whatever you want to call them, right, wanted to, uh, like they just wanted their elevation in society in french society you understand they didn't necessarily care for black liberty whereas the people who were black or african were wanted that black liberty so so and you know even though they're all fighting on the same side you have to realize that vision is going to change so it's actually pretty critical that you know even though this guy doesn't survive this revolution that in putting forth hair look let's do this let's let's follow along the lines of free enterprise you know, let's follow on along the lines of, 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 of commodities and labor and, and all that kind of stuff. Let's follow along the lines of taxation for services and so on and so forth. Let's do, let's do capitalism, right? Because they did that, like he contributed to this revolution and shaped the direction of, of what France was afterward. And remember that France has, you know, with every revolution, there's counter-revolutionaries, there's all sorts of stuff. So eventually Napoleon comes about and Napoleon is fighting... Uh, Haiti and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's really important. So he says, Smith's ideas were also popularized in Britain in the late 18th century, attracting readers well beyond the small circles of enlightened. You see that? Like, it's not just the enlightened people and the elite, but it's well beyond that, right? That was helped in part through the publication in 1797 of a complete analysis or abridgment of Dr. Smith's inquiry into the nature and cause of the wealth of nations. Other inexpensive editions aimed at a popular audience followed, especially with the expiration of the honorary copyright in 1804, when it became easier for any British publisher to go to a market with an edition of Smith's Shore Seller. So, yeah, so it's a Shore Seller. So it's not just a bestseller, it's a Shore Seller, right? And everybody's just like, yeah, let's go get it. At the same time, a decidedly scholarly audience for Wealth of Nation was increasing around the world. In 1814, David Buchanan, an English economist, published the first critical edition of Wealth of Nations. Translations and editions continued, and by the midpoint of the 19th century, the English historian Henry Thomas Buckle could proclaim in the history of civilization in England that the Wealth of Nation was probably the most important book that has ever been written. You see what I'm saying? And they esteem this guy. What, what, I, what I mean by that is that, you know, but like, again, like I said, you can't even imagine that sort of that sort of treatment for us as a people because we as a people don't even do this kind of stuff for ourselves. Like, we don't write history of civilization in Seneca. You know what I mean? History of civilization in Yoruba land. Uh, history of civilization in Africa. Now, not to say that we don't have any of those books because we do, obviously. Right. But it's more so even if you wrote that, that's not highly circulated. It's not highly circulated. And by highly circulated, I mean, I'll say it this way. I mind my business on Twitter. Right. And then suddenly, like I might be strong, like I like I've kind of muted, you know, muted and blocked quite a few people for this. But, you know, if I didn't use that mute block function or whatever, I would I would just be seeing, you know, Megan's body and you know nothing wrong with Megan's body you know uh, like nothing wrong with it obviously but what I'm saying is that even if you're just minding your business you can hear and see like like not just Megan there's this there's this I don't want to say his name there's this black guy who I'm telling you I was minding my business 
Actually, I'll tell you this right here. Mind my business, you know, just whatever. My son has a, uh, has a, uh, like, like, a, like, kind of like a phone, right? Where he can use apps, right? So he's playing this this app, and sometimes, like, what happened was I it was originally learning apps, but he learned how to download his own apps somehow. Uh, even when I disable the Play Store. He could re-enable it, which was weird. Anyway, but so 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 he's just like whatever, does what he wants. Uh, what happens is that I hear this song playing, and it's from this this dude who's just like, like you guys know who I'm talking about. He's like he's yeah. But but the thing is this, I notice what the song is, so I rush over to him and see what the freak his ad is, and it's not really, you know, it doesn't really show anything. But the point is that. Even I would know this guy's music, but I wouldn't know that there was a history book released for uh, the, 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 the Luo. You know, that wouldn't just fall onto me. Uh, that some dude is like dancing with, you know, yeah, I, that could fall onto me. You know, that this song is addicting, yeah, that would fall onto me, right? That, 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 that this, uh, whatever that, oh, Will Smith was getting played by his wife, that, that, that could fall onto me. That's, that's the gossip. That's the grapevine. But, uh, literally, right? But, but the fact that, you know, somebody publishing a book is not, you know, oh my gosh, right? It's like, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, it's, we're a long ways away from that global dominance, that success. We're a long ways away. Because, because publishing, but publishing books is not nearly as, as anything, you know, uh, as a thing. So, again, I repeat, you know, the, this history of civilization in England tells you that The Wealth of Nations is probably the most important book that has ever been written. Obviously, it says, By then, the dismal science which Smith had done so much to found was well established. Smith had become the recognized originator for laissez-faire economics. The French, but not Smith, had created the term he never used. Okay, so he never used the term laissez-faire economics, but, you know, it's still a nice... Uh, like, it's still, for, you know, still interesting, right? Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's associated with it. And it's like, you know, we have to have our own economic sense. I'm telling you, the, the importance of economics is, is not to be downplayed. It's not to be downplayed. I was having a conversation with somebody earlier, and it's like, yeah, don't... Like, economics is so fundamental and so critical to our very existence, literally. Literally. And yet we, we completely ignore it. And because we completely ignore it... Uh, like, like we're constantly being dominated, and it's it's almost a joke at this point. But don't worry. At some point, I'm I'm I'm, uh, if I am able to, I I I want to write more in depth on it. You know, and and it's up to you to make it a short seller. <laughs> All right. In most recent years, Smith and the Wealth of Nations, in particular, has also benefited from burgeoning scholarship. Smith's writings can now be conveniently found in the Glasgow edition of his works. There has been numerous monographs, volumes of interpretive essays, an intellectual life by Nicholas Philipson, and a critical biography by Ian Simpson Ross, recently reprinted in a new edition. Work on the Scottish Enlightenment has given us a more nuanced Adam Smith. Modern scholars have increasingly come to see that it is not accurate to see Smith as the apostle of an immoral free market capitalist economic system. He was certainly not blind to the potentially negative moral consequences of market forces or the possibly devastating implication of the division of labor for individual laborers. As Smith put in The Wealth of Nations, in the progress of the division of labor, the employment of the far greater part of those who live by labor, that is, of the great body of the people, comes to be confined to do a few very simple operations, frequently to one or two, but the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations, of which the effects too are perhaps always the same, or very nearly the same, has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out expedients for removing difficulties which never occur. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. Uh, this is actually pretty interesting. So there's two things to, go to this. Two things to this, right? Actually, he's going to go into how Karl Marx uses it. But I want to say there's two things. I want to say it before, uh, I guess, before he does. Uh, 
one, this, uh, well, I guess the more important thing, I'll say the second thing. Uh, the more important thing is that artificial intelligence seeks to replace human labor. And this is actually something that Karl Marx noted as well. You know, not just artificial intelligence, but machinery, well, not exactly, like machinery and eventually artificial intelligence are, are automatic machines, right? Re re technically automatic machines, but eventually artificial intelligence as well would replace the need for human labor. And this is why uh, socialism and communism are supposed to be uh, systems toward. So a lot of people don't understand what socialism and communism are, but basically this is the idea, capitalism is this idea that the bourgeoisie uh, organize labor and uh, they organize labor to run this efficient system, but then they, yeah, and then so socialism is this idea that, hey, you, you know, well, the capitalist, what happens in the capitalist system is that the capitalist takes most of the profit, right? Obviously. Uh, they take the profit for their own, you know, devices and they overproduce and they seek new markets and, you know, this new markets and this overproduction can cause ecological devastation. But what if, for instance, you were not to uh, seek new markets, but you were just to uh, build exactly according to the needs of the people or even just more near the needs of the people, right? Uh, what if the capitalist is in fact superfluous? And then so what socialism is, is this idea that the proletariat, the workers of these industries uh, should overtake the capitalists who are superfluous, uh, particularly before the capitalist renders the laborers superfluous. You see what I'm saying? Because when artificial intelligence and all these other things happen, the laborer becomes superfluous. You know, we don't need you to make sandwiches if, if a machine can. We don't need you to make... Uh, we don't need you to make, uh, we don't need you to sweep the floor if a machine can, you know? Uh, so what happens with the, the, the proletariat? Oh, we don't need you to screw in the bolts for a car if a machine can. And, you know, the machine's already replaced that, obviously. But the, the idea is that uh, you would, yeah, so you'd revolt against these, these bourgeoisie, you'd take over the factories, and therefore you know, create according to the needs of people. And if you advance that community uh, of, of the socialists, you advance the socialists, advance that economic order uh, to the point where the systems, the factories can run themselves without human labor, then humans can get their needs met without working. You understand? Now, of course, this is, I believe, a misunderstanding in the sense of, well, where are the resources coming from? You understand? Uh, it, it, realistically speaking, if you're in a factory in Europe, you still need to get resources out of Africa. And unless you're automating that resource extraction in Africa, you're probably exploiting the labor of the, Af of, of the, of the African people. You understand? Now, you could technically say, well, yeah, you could devise a global system. That's why communism is considered a global system where it's like workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose with your chains. But the idea is that you would, you could automatic and automatically, uh, you know, let's say extract the coltan from a coltan mine, you know, build machinery that can do it instead of the children who do it now. Uh, you could do that. Uh, there's no, there's, well, like what happened with Africa right now is that it's not necessarily economically develop, developed to the point where it would or could. You know, uh, it would. And then here's the here's the other kicker is that who is to say or what is to say that the resources in Africa uh, are the entitlement of the people of Europe? You get what I'm saying? Uh, and not just that, if you eliminate these borders, like, like basically the, the, now the resource control is given to the people in Europe. I mean, not to say that it's not already there, but. More to say that if you are an African and you're advocating for the resource control, like essentially like this, I'll say it this way. You want to produce phones, right? Like you want to produce laptops. You, you have this factory in Europe that produces laptops. It needs resources out of Africa to produce those laptops, right? Those laptops are going to go to each and every American or, or European who wants it, right? And so what that means is that Africa is now extracted of these resources, these resources, whether they're automatically or by human, shipped over to Europe and then processed and made into 
uh, goods for the Americans and the Europeans. And you're supposed to just say, yeah, that's a good system. You know, whereas what the better system is for you as an African person is to have your own factory that gets that labor, you know, even if it is automatically or by human, but you probably prefer the automatic uh, line and you get that labor and then you just keep those laptops to yourself. Or if anything, you would sell those laptops to another people. You get what I'm saying? Now, Europe does not want you selling laptops to them. They want to build the laptops. But again, this is why the world is is bound to be an internal I- internal discord. You understand? And, and this is why the communist and the socialist vision is not very realistic. You know uh, what happened? For instance, I'll give you this. Uh, Albert Einstein writes uh, writes uh, America about the nuclear bomb, and the nuclear bomb is uh, and he's uranium. And Albert Einstein himself says. Get the uranium from the Congo. He says it. Look, the guy who's about peace. He says, like you could read his letter. He tells FDR, "Go get that con- that uranium from the Congo." Right, and and of course, you know, if you look at how they get the uranium, it's probably, you know, I mean, I hope it's not African people, but you know, it probably is. But regardless, you know, the point being that that's that's this is the world. The real world is that the resources are not in Europe. But the Europeans have this technology. And in order to stay ahead, they have to keep you behind, right? Uh, the other part of this, though, the other part was that, uh, yeah, yeah, basically the, 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 the way how labor works, the division of labor works, is that, yeah, it does make you more, like, like if you're a politician, if you're just sweeping, if you're just sweeping. So one of the things that, like I said, about communism is that uh, they, re- like, like, oh, yeah, all right. I think it's. I think he's going to talk about it. So let's go into it. It says, not surprisingly, passages like this helped m- to inspire Karl Marx's 1818 to 1883 view on the alienation of labor in his critique of the capitalist systems. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. It's, it's this idea that you, like, like what labor does to the human being is it, it, it can, like, reduce you. You know, it can reduce you. And if you're doing the same thing repetitively over and over again, over and over again. Now, you might think, well, now we have, uh, like, different occupations, like 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 more green co- or whatever it's called, blue collar uh, or white collar, white collar. Uh, but, but, uh, but outside of that, uh, but again, like, even those are being replaced by machines. Uh, but anyway, so all of this serves to remind that Adam Smith's reputation changes with the times. The Adam Smith of popular consciousness and the Adam Smith of the wealth of nations are not always one and the same. There are many ways to approach Smith's wealth of nations, and readers of the text reprinted below will have to judge Smith's meaning for themselves, just as readers of past generations have done. Smith himself offers some guidance to his readers by providing us with an introduction and plan of the work. There, Smith gives a description of his goals in each of the volume's first books. In book one, of the case of improvement in the productive powers of labor and of the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks of the people, Smith takes at his point of departure the annual labor of every nation. While the proportion between the number of those who are employed in useful labor and that of those who are not so employed is important in determining a nation's production, even more important, he says, is the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which the nation's labor is employed. Smith reasons that in more advanced nations, i.e. those that are civilized and thriving, even one of the lowest and poorest order, if he is frugal and industrious, may enjoy a greater share of the necessities and convenience of life than is possible for any savage to acquire. So, in the, deeper in the book, he tells you that, and that's actually an important point, deeper in the book, he does explicitly say, you know, the average workman, right, or the lowest workman in Europe has a, has a more... Uh, like, like has a more, like almost. I want to say. I want to say advanced. I can't remember. That. I'll, I'll actually like to look at the quote, but I'll have to look at the quote because I don't want to mess it up because it's gonna be sensitive for a lot of black folk. I put it on Discord, and somebody was saying, "Yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you gotta throw away. It's not a book we should even read." You know what I mean? Uh, because it is uh a little bit on the nose. Oh yeah, here it goes. He says. I'm surprised I didn't uh, bookmark it, but he says, uh, 
compared indeed with the more extravagant luxury of the great, his accommodation must not doubt must no doubt appear extremely simple and easy. And this is against the uh, kings or whatever of, of Europe. And yet it may be true, perhaps, that the accommodation of a European prince does not always so much exceed that of an industrious and frugal present as the accommodation of the latter exceeds that of many an African king, the absolute masters of the lives and liberties of 10,000 naked savages. So this is the end of chapter one of book one. But but basically what his, what his mindset is is that you know, there's so much cooperation and assistance uh, going on to make your life easier as a Westerner, if you're a Westerner. So, like, for instance, I have this mic, this microphone, like there's a lot of cooper human cooperation that went into building this microphone, you know? Or if I have clothes on, or yeah, I do have clothes on, but what I'm saying is that when you wear clothes, it's like they're, they're, it goes through a, well, he, he details the process, but it goes through a weaver, a dive, a dyer, uh, 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 this and that, uh, a trucker, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me see if I could read it just so that you guys could get what I'm saying. It says, the shepherd, the sort of clothes, the... Uh, hold on a second. Uh, let's see. Different drugs made of use. Okay, so he says... To say nothing of the complicated machines of the ship and the sailor, the miller and the fuller, or even the loomer of the loom of the weaver, let us consider all the varieties. Yeah, basically he's going through how much work goes into a shirt, and there's the loomers, the shippers, the the uh, so on and so forth. We learned this in the, if you went to the public fool system, uh, you know what he's talking about. He says the woolen coat, for example, which covers the day laborer as coarse and rough as it may appear, is the produce of the joint labor of a great multitude of workmen. The shepherd, the sorter of wool, the wool comber or carter, the dyer, the scribbler, the spinner, the weaver, the fuller, and the dresser, with many others, must all join their different arts in order to complete even this homely production. How many merchants and carriers besides must have been employed in transporting the materials from some of those workmen to others who often live in a very distant part of the country? How much commerce and navigation in particular, how many shipbuilders, sailors, Sailors, sail makers, rope makers must have been employed in order to bring together the different drugs made use of by the dyer, which often came from the remotest corners of the world. What a variety of labor, too, is necessary in order to produce the tools of the meanness of these workmen. To say nothing of such complicated machines as the ship of the sailor, the mill of the floor, or even the loom of the weaver, let us consider only what a variety of labor is requisite in order to form the very simple machine, the shear, with which the shepherd clips the wool, the machine, the miner, the builder of the furnace for smelting the ore, the feller of the timber, the burner of the charcoal to be made use of by the smelting house, the brick maker, the, you know, you get it, right? So, uh, obviously, you know, even though a woolen coat you know, has so much human cooperation going on with it. Whereas what he would say about, you know, like let's say you're the king of some village and that's the, like, a, like a very, very, like, and he's just talking about like a very basic village. But like in a basic village, you might be like, hey, the king is wearing a coat of lion skin and it doesn't really take much to make a coat of lion skin. You know what I mean? Like, sh like sure, like, like the same person who made the knife kill the lion and cut off his skin. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's not necessarily going to be the same exact person, but you kind of get that there's not really too much stuff. And what anyway, I would look at is more to say that they were very local and other people were very international. And I also want people to... So like I said, if I do end up writing this other book, or when I do end up writing this other book, I might bring in the example of, you know, like the question of what do an international people really want from a local people? As to say that, you know... For those of you who are westernized, right, what is it that you could trade with the people who are hunter-gatherers? Like, what is it that you want from a hunter-gatherer? What is it that you want from a nomad? What is it that you even want from an agriculturalist? You know, uh, when you think about how these industrialists arrived into Africa, when, you know, a lot of us think of it in a negative light, you know, like they're terrible people, and that's fine, that's well and good. I don't, I don't doubt that they're terrible people. But what I'm asking here is, uh, what is it that, like, how was trade supposed to go? If they, if, you know, like, truly, if an industrialist or a Westerner goes into Africa, they probably, uh, depending on where Africa was on a, uh, well, actually, just, just to say that what you want to trade with Africa would be its resources. 
You get what I'm saying? And then how you get those resources by changing the people into laborers in those resource fields, like resource extractors. And so what you find in the global economic system is that Africa was reduced to exporting resources. But the part of the reason is that, realistically speaking, what else would they have wanted from you? Like, do they want manufacture? Do they want food? You get what I'm saying? Um, so, so I mean, that's a, that's another thing altogether, and it, and it and it does inform us as to what we need to do for ourselves and how we need to engage ourselves, and also what we need to communicate to our people, and why, you know. Um, because because I'll I'll say this because I spoke about it today, but you guys obviously it was a private conversation, but one of the key things I, I keep pointing to economics is so important, right? One of the key things Wazungu did was he took us off our land. And when he takes us off our land, uh, then we had to, in order to survive, go into the mines and work for his money or whatever, right? What that also tells you is that in order to restore us, we have to get our land. We have to have our land, but we have to have our land in such a way that we are, again, economically independent. You know, this is why Wazungu, you know, I, I keep telling you guys about uh, one of the things I don't like about African American Pan Africanism, in a sense, or African American centered Pan Africanism (ACPA), uh, but also continental Pan Africanism, is that the ACPA kind of focus on culture and psychology, and you know, if we get our culture back, and oh my gosh, if we get our, you know, if we knew where our tribe, we knew who our people were, right? And that's not right because it's not going to do anything. Uh, the the other one is the continental. The continental said, no, 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 we already know who our tribes are. But we got to get our governments. We got to get our politics. And the reason why the Westerner was like, "Oh, okay, sure," is because you didn't. We didn't get that you really had to get that economy. You really had to get your economy. You understand? Uh, you had to get that economic independence because when you have that economic independence, a lot of things, a lot of other things don't matter. A lot of other things don't even matter. You know, if, if Wazungu showed up and he didn't take you off the land, he would have just been mining himself. You understand? And you would have had nothing to do with him. You wouldn't, you wouldn't buy his stuff. You wouldn't engage him. You wouldn't be a market because you wouldn't have any money because you already have everything you want. It's only because he took away, he, you're economically dependent on him that you, you became that consumer of people. So uh, that's really important. Um, let me see. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of went on a little tangent, but I hope that was, uh, I hope that was, uh, enough. Let's see something. So let's keep reading this right here. So he says, there Smith gave a good description of the so on and so forth. Uh, departure with a proportion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was the savage part. Um, lowest order frugal. I'm just trying to read it, see where I'm at. So the text of wealth of nation shows that for Smith, it was the division of labor that held the key to expanding any nation's productivity. To this day, book one remains best, perhaps the best known part of Smith's book. It is here that Smith argues nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog nobody ever saw one animal by its gestures and natural cries signify to another that is mine and that's yours i'm willing to give this for that but man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren and it is vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only he will answer that it's vain for you to expect uh help by benevolence only You know what, I'm, I was going to finish this paragraph, but nah. I'm not even going to finish this paragraph. Make sure you subscribe to the other podcasts. This is D-Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on K. W-A-Z Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the pro-black perspective on KWAZ Radio. All right. Um, yeah. So we're going to go back into it. 
But, oh my gosh, you see, I said, I said this. I said, we're the only people that expect to be protected by the goodwill of our enemies. But it's pretty interesting to see even this guy, Adam Smith, the founder of capitalism, telling you it'd be stupid to look for help from other people through benevolence. Like, it's, it's, just, it's just common damn sense. We're going to go back into it. it. says, nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. Nobody ever saw one animal by its gestures and natural cries signify to another, this is mine and that's yours. I'm willing to give this for that. But man has always constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. Whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind proposes to do this. So one of the things is um, I'm going to point out to you, I want you to really understand this, right, is that this is called reciprocity. Uh, the law of reciprocity, I say, is our way, African way, right? The European way is the law of exploitation, I would say, right? Uh, I would say that's their way, right? Um, yeah, um, whatever. Uh, I would say that's their way. Why am I telling you this? He's articulating reciprocity. And what's interesting is this, that we, like, if you really, really process this, if you really think about it, you have to realize that, well, well as I'm reading this, I realize when people say, you know, racism if you will i don't use the word racism you know that you could check out the podcast uh i think it's episode six uh where i'm like don't stop using the word racism like it could be episode five it could be episode six who knows but uh i just say that word confuses you but you could kind of see how this is built into this capitalist system in the sense of how labor is is going to naturally be undervalued if you don't value the people you know uh so labor, labor can be exploited. Like labor can be underpaid, you know, uh, in the sense that uh, one of the things that this guy will reason is that labor should be proportional to the uh, extent of toil and so on and so forth that goes through it, right? Uh, so 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 to say that if you're Mining, and I'm just reading this, so you know, bear with me. But it's it's a really simple idea in the sense of if I'm digging up a, a yard, right, or if I'm digging up corn and you're digging up corn, right, uh, and technically we produce the same amount of corn, let's say, right, uh, and we have the same physicality, let's pretend, right, then like technically that should be the equal pay, right? But check this out what if? I'm white, okay? What if I'm white? I shouldn't even say that. That sounds weird, right? But what I mean is what if there's a white person and there's a white employer and you're doing this same gardening or you're doing this farming of corn in Europe and then I, you know, an African person, let's say that now, right? I'm doing the, the farming in Senegal. Should I get the same pay? And you might say, yeah, of course, right? But the question becomes... Why would I pay the same if I were, like, why would the European boss pay the same? And then not just that, it comes to this as well. What if, hear this, what if your labor in Africa is worth less because there are so many people willing to do it? You get what I'm saying? You destroy the economy. Or what have you. Like, why would I still pay top dollar if I could, for instance, pay 10 people? I could pay a tenth to you and have 10 people doing that labor. You get what I'm saying? Now, we would come around and we'd say, hey, that's exploitation. All right? Makes sense. And it makes sense. You know, there's a real value. The real value is that, hey, this worker in, in, in Europe... He works for corn, and there's like so few people who are willing to do the corn thing, but he works for corn in, in Europe, and therefore he should get more. Uh, whereas in Africa, where we can get 20 people, 
who, if they die, there's no legal consequence. There's nobody who could sue them. There's nothing. You know? Why would I? Why would I? You, you get what I'm saying? So it, to a large extent, you know, and this is like, if you really study it, this is what slavery is. This is what Western chattel slavery is. Uh, but it's also what, uh, you know, uh, sweatshops are. It's, it's also what capitalism looks like today in, in various uh, nations where you have these huge labor forces that you don't that you can underpay. You know, and, you know, quite a few people understand that you can do this and the cost of living is reduced over there because uh, not too many people can buy things anyway. Uh, you know, if you're trying to sell, like you can't sell something for the same price that you would in America because, uh, you know, they don't have that kind of money. You know, I could, like, for instance, I tell you, I tell you guys, one time I went to Jamaica and, uh, I, uh, yeah, my son and I went and got meals and he didn't even finish it. You know, we went to like a restaurant and it's just a regular, it's actually regular price food, honestly. So it was like five bucks or whatever. Right. Um, for a meal or, or $13 for a meal or whatever, right? And, like, yeah, $13 for a meal is, like, you know, a little expensive in America, but it's not it's not unusual where I'm at, right? Uh, so I got two for my son, and I kind of just threw it away the West, rest. But I'm looking around, and there was these, these beautiful sisters, right? Beautiful women. And they were sitting down sharing a drink. You know what I mean? Like, they went to a restaurant to share a drink. Like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like one drink. Uh... Maybe possibly to, you know, sit there where there are guys and they probably attract some guy's attention and he could be able to buy them food or something. But the reality is that, you know, money has a greater value in other countries as well. And so the payment, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that goes into it. But you would, in a sense, be able to. Like, like you could say something about exploitation and so on and so forth. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought as to why we were talking about that. But it's a, it's a really interesting train of thought. Um, so we're going to go back to the text. But he says it'd be vain. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's reciprocity. So reciprocity is, 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 is the end-all, be-all. But again, it, it does stand to reason that if you are a visitor to another place and you don't really care about the people, and you shouldn't, because why should you care about a people that you're visiting? Um then you might just underpay them. You know? I mean, it's like chances are you're going to underpay them. Uh, you'd have to, like, especially if they're different people. You know, one of the things about, and this is actually, if you really think about it, this, like, goes back to Liberia, honestly. You know, you have to be socially conditioned to see yourself as the same people as the other people, right? Which is actually very, very difficult. And, it, and what makes it more difficult is, again, like I said, you come from a different economic system, you know, where you don't really have, like, they don't have anything of value to you. Like, let's say, let's pretend, let's pretend for a second we have this Liberia situation, right? Let's pretend we're Africans in America coming from slavery uh, on, on the purse of white America, okay? What is it that you value when you get into Africa? You know, what among the natives... Is it that you value when you get there? Right? Because what you want is that church from America. What you want is that government building. What you want is this and that and, and, and all those stuff. What you want is a plate of food from, you know, you want plates. You want silverware. You want houses. You want rugs. You want this. You want all the Western conveniences you had. And where are you going to get that if you just came into a land where the people don't have any of those things. You see what I'm saying? And so, again, I mean, because I know some people are listening and saying, well, that's, there you go, culture. You know, culture, you have to think you're the same people. But realistically speaking, you have to go back into what this economics was, which is the economics of the situation was that you were actually uh, a people who wanted... Why, like, like your economy, your economic system, what was going to fund your whole, like what was going to contribute to your survival was your engagement with Europe, not your engagement with the natives. You understand? And then if the natives were to fight you, because they would, why wouldn't they? You're imposing on their land. 
you push them off, you're so and so far. If they were to fight you, right, you would have to get assistance from whom? From the natives? You understand? Uh, and again, you don't even have the same language. Uh, now, it could be that, uh, you know, somebody could make the argument. Well, and again, like I said, when you have land, you can go about with everything else. But uh, someone could make the argument, well, if you had the culture, right? Uh, you know, the culture, which was, you know, uh, you know, black power, blah, 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 blah. It might be viable. But again, it's, it's a very, very long shot in the sense of y what you would be thinking of is people from Africa, sorry, people from America just going into the village life of people from Africa and just blending in, right? And the only question is, is that what you want? Is that what you think is reasonable for people to just go and give up everything that they once were and and uh, and like all their learning and all their religion and all their everything that they had and then just become one of the people without any of the western conveniences and it's like yeah you could expect that but um you know chances are you're not going to have a lot of people who go along with that and because you don't have a lot of people who go along with that you did end up with uh slavery you know, the, the Liberian would go over there and enslave African people. And it's not a good thing. But if you study this thing from an economic standpoint, you kind of see it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And so the fact that you could see Africans do it, you know, because once upon a time I thought, I used to think, hey, you know, they only knew slavery, so they're going to practice slavery as well, right? But I don't think that's even a reasonable thing anymore. I think what happened was not that they only knew slavery, so they had to practice slavery. It's that uh, they could not eat. You know what I mean? Like, like they were put into a place. Like, they could not. Like, essentially, Africa was not developed to the point where it could accommodate the Western taste. So they had to build a Western economy there. And the Western economy especially at the time, did thrive on that sort of... Uh, like, like, like what, what the Western economy did was that in displacing the indigenous people, the indigenous people's only opportunity was to be labor for the people with the money or with the uh, resources, with the land, with the economy. You know? Not to say that it's on the indigenous people. Of course not. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really something to work out. I'll, I'll, like I said, I'm going to... After I go to Africa, right, I want to work on a book. So I'm going to probably work out this idea. Uh, hopefully you like the little pontification, you know. And if you have any thoughts on it, just comment in this. Just drop some comments. I'm going to read them, okay? Uh, all right. Uh, I like reading comments. All right, so let's go on. Smith summarizes, give me that which I want and you shall have this which you want is the meaning of every such offer. And it is this manner that we obtain from one another the far greater part of the good offices which we stand in need of. For Smith, civilized society is a trading society. So again, when you talk about civilized, they're talking about trading. But again, I want to emphasize this. I, keep, I, I don't think you guys are getting it. I mean, I know you're getting it, but I want to re-emphasize this. The, the industrialists had nothing to trade with you. And they still don't. You know, the only thing they want to trade with you is raw materials. Because cause you, cause that's, that's the whole thing. It's like, if you're not up to their industrial level, then why would they trade with you? You know? Like, why would they trade a car for a car if you don't make cars? You know? You, you get what I'm saying? Like, why would they trade? Like, why would they trade anything with you for cars if you don't make cars? You know what I mean? Like, what is it that you make? And not to say that Africa didn't have manufacture back when it, uh, when it did, but the reality is that even if it did, even though it did have manufacture, which it did, uh, and by manufacture I mean like clothes and, and, and art and all that kind of stuff, even though it had those things, it's not to say that they wanted it or that Africans made it in such a volume. You know, the thing that, uh, I don't know if, I, I'm, I'm actually not even sure if he's going to talk about it, so... I'm going to go into it. The thing that uh, 
the thing that, that Smith really emphasizes is division of labor. And it's this idea that if you, uh, if you divide labor intelligently, right, you can produce things even more so than if you had people just doing everything instead. You know, so if you had a Smith, like if you had a metal worker who did all the metal work, if you ask them to build nails, they'll probably make a thousand nails. Whereas if you had a young person who uh, didn't do anything but make nails, they can probably make 8,000 nails. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the point, and, 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 and of course it goes back into even like, like let's say the car production. If you had one person make a car, including getting all the metal and so forth, it would probably take them, you know, months or a year or something, right? And so if you had like, no, not, not a year, sorry. But, like, it would probably take them a month or something, right? You know, to actually go and get the metal, like, from the mine and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. Take them quite a bit of time. Uh, but if you had eight people where one person gets the metal, one person does this, one person does that, one person does the car tire, one person does that. If you have eight or maybe more than eight, 40 people, right, doing that, then you could make a car every day or, or even 10 cars a day. You get what I'm saying? Or 20 or even 100 cars a day. The point being that when you divide labor up like that, you can you can accomplish that. And what happens is that it could be that a lot of our societies did have some degree of division of labor but or subdivision of labor on top of that, but not to the extent that the industrialists had it by the time they reached uh, Africa. You know, So we could have been building exquisite clothes, but... Even when, but even while Zunga was making handmade clothes, but the handmade clothes can't compete with the industrially made clothes, the machine built clothes. And because it can't, you know, while Zunga's not looking to buy shirts from you, he's not looking to buy clothes from you, he's not looking to trade cars for clothes. You get what I'm saying? So I think that's a really important point. Um, and I think I covered it, so it's okay. Uh, and so, yeah, you could probably go and read this book. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm going to try to finish it myself. I'm going to try to, and look, I'm going to tell you guys, I want to lead Nkrumah and Nyere as well. So I'm going to tell you that. And I should probably finish Cabral as well. I'm probably not going to read those to you. Maybe Cabral, because I did start that series. But uh, I, uh, but like, I, I want to write, read these people so that we can really get to uh, working on our, working out our own ideas for what we need to do as a people. Um, so anyway, so I'm big two. Of the nature, accumulation, and employment of stock, Smith argues that the, regardless of the actual state of the skill, dexterity, and judgment of a nation's applied labor, it is the proportion between the number of those who are annual employed and useful labor and that of those who are not so employed, which matters. And those who are usefully employed are in proportion to the quantity of capital stock. For Smith's wealth is not properly measured in gold or silver, as the merchant mercantilists of the day saw it, but rather in terms of useful commodities and the skill of the producers. Uh, basically, like I said, you know, you want division of labor around capital, you know, so it's capital organized labor, you know, you want intelligently organized labor. That's how you are going to get wealth. So, uh, you know, the example I would give about the division of labor is like, like I said, the jum the djembe is like the better example. But if you wanted to build a djembe, you could do that in like a day, you know, I've, I've seen videos of people or like maybe like a few hours, like like ten hours or something, or eight hours or whatever, or six hours, right? Uh, you can go out, cut down a tree, you know, forge an iron ring, uh, put it around the top of the tree, decorate the 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 the, the djembe. Maybe not that many years, maybe not that many hours, right? But the point is that you can produce that very slowly. But you could also have a assembly of people, you know, like you could have eight people producing eight 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 draw eight djembes in four hours, or you can have eight people producing a djembe every, you know, every, uh, every hour or something, right? So, uh, or like just really quickly, what I'm saying is that, you know, because you can have one person making the rings, one person cutting down the trees, one person building the, bringing the trees, one person so on and so forth. And, and that would just be like quickly. So that's the whole idea of what the origin of labor is. And so it really comes around capital. So the capital in those cases would be the tree, the forest, the trees, you know, and so somebody would own those trees. Well, not necessarily own the trees, but you would have a claim to those trees. And by having a claim to those trees, nobody else can interrupt your production process. And now all you would need, though, is you would have to. But you understand when you're overproducing djembes, you then have to find a market for those djembes. And so 
you have to sell those gem base to other people and blah 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 and so that's that's where the whole system comes in and then it becomes well what if you keep making gem base and nobody in your country wants gem base well then you go to another country and say here's some gem base that you want now it might not necessarily be gem base are the thing that everybody wants you know it could be televisions it could be cars it could be so on and so forth and and the thing is that like i said africa did not like essentially wazungu beat us to this industrialization and and the consequence were dear you know and and like this uh this brother uh tells me often that you know there's there's another race that people are doing which would be like artificial intelligence and and wazungu is trying to beat us in that as well you know or like china's racing towards it russia's racing towards it america's racing towards it and it's just a new uh, interface it's, an, it's, a, it's a new front line and we're still not even caught up to the industrial one um but uh now some people believe that you know artificial intelligence is is uh something that everybody can catch up to like you know you don't have to have that industrial blah blah, blah. but it is what it is now here's another thing that you could want to uh you could want to mass produce solar solar energy uh solar energy uh panels that's something that you can mass produce uh yeah, you, you hear me, I'm green. Anyway, let's keep going. So, and those who are usually employed, blah, blah, blah. So book three of the different progress of opulence in the different nations offers an historical survey of the plans that various nations have had with respect to the application of labor. While Smith rarely identified his intellectual targets directly, book three is aimed in part at what Smith saw as a physiocrat's overemphasis on agricultural wealth. Now, again, we have that same thing going on, the overemphasis on agricultural wealth. But it's worth, I think it's going to be worth for me to read it and see what he's talking about, see where his arguments are, see how they, you know, bounce. Because so far I'm reading his arguments and I'm like, yeah, they're all right. But, um, you know, it's enjoyable. You know, I think it's more enjoyable than uh, social media. All right, Smith remarks that since the downfall of the Roman Empire, the policy of Europe has been more favorable to arts, manufacture, and commerce, all of which is centered on towns rather than to agriculture, which is associated with the countryside. And again, you know, this, this is actually also important. I do want to point out, like I read something earlier, where one of the things that's really important is this idea that, uh, you know, we as Westerners, we are learning and acquiring skills suitable for the town but whereas but like if we really want to do things in the countryside like we're not necessarily being equipped for it you know and so like we might have high skills for town life but do we have our own indigenous towns yet you know because a lot of our towns for those of you who might not know are just leftovers of wazungu's towns you know and a lot of them do rely on and depend on uh, Wazungu imports, you know? So that's also something to remember. So book four of the Systems of Political Economy is concerned to map out what Smith sees as the different theories of political economy. Those theories, he reminds us, have had a considerable influence not only upon the opinions of men of learning, but upon the public conduct of princes and sovereign states. So again, you see, this is really important. The fact that the princes and and sovereign states uh, and the sovereigns of states, as well as uh, he says sovereign states, but still of the sovereigns of states uh, and and the learned people are sharing theories among each other, that's actually like applaudable. You know, he's not writing for. Uh, and he's like, he's not just writing for the masses. See, a lot of what we do is like, you know, like, like I can tell you, some people talk about political education. Like, this is one of those words that I really, like I'm telling you, this is one of those words I really want you to understand. Political education is inform, like information on, 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 on uh, political education is how to uh, make, is how to like essentially, see, I'm, I'm actually fumbling my own words, right? Uh I, I got to write a book. I got to write a book so I can actually just read it for you guys. Um, I'm pretty good at reading, right? Uh, political education would be like, like the defense of your economic order, okay? Like a political education should be the defense of your economic order. What we know as political education today is nothing like that. So I was recently informed that there's a celebrity... Uh, I shouldn't even say her name, to be honest. But Actually, I'll say her name. She's not that bad. I mean, I don't like how she uses the N-word, but... Uh, okay, so her name is No Name or something like that, right? And she opens up this library for political education, and allegedly. And the thing is this, that she opens this library for political education, and if you look through the book list that she encourages, it's a bunch of, 
you know, oh, LGBTQ, you know, black and brown and blah, blah. Nothing to do with, uh, nothing to do with embracing uh, a viable and real economy or economic structure. You know, maybe it could, you know, flirt with socialism, but that flirting with socialism is very re- unrealistic. You know, especially, and I, like I said, more so unrealistic when you think about what socialism is uh, in regards to what I explained earlier as, as in the sense that it's a revolution of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie, uh, assuming that there's a bourgeoisie even in Africa, you know, and assuming that you have the, the volume and the number in America or a Western nation to overcome the bourgeoisie and assuming that the Wazungu actually wants a revolution, a violent overthrow of their masters in these Western nations, uh, uh, as opposed to social democracy, which would be, um, which would be uh, like like not having a revolution and just kind of uh, voting in a better policies, you know. Which is uh, again, I want to point out that there's this. Uh, I was I was on this 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 Twitter discussion, and I know I should wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up soon. Don't worry. Uh, there's this Twitter discussion with uh, with uh, this, this this lady from Canada, and it goes back again to this culture comes from the politics, comes from economics, in the sense of uh, she's talking about like she's she's it's it's drilled into her head that her economy is different from America's, you know, like like she's confusing herself. She's like you can't have a capitalist and a socialist country, and 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 America is a capitalist country, and I'm like, yeah, Canada is a capitalist country too. And she's like, no, and I'm like, but the Canada didn't have any revolution of the proletariat over the over the over the bourgeoisie. And even Lenin writes that you have to be wary of the social democrats because the social democrats will, you know, ally with the unions, and the unions would make it so that uh, the people, the, the proletariat, are comfortable and do not want to revolt against the leadership, against the bourgeoisie. And she's like, no, no. But it's just like, yeah, the culture that she was taught was that she was taught to look at another culture as that's the inferior one. That's not as good. And that's what you have to do as a like to, to, to form that political cohesion. You talk like like you, you, you form beliefs among people that your culture is better and their culture is worse. And we saw that earlier with the anti-Scottish sentiments in Oxford. And we see that also in the example I gave of France and Senegal. You give, you give people, hey, our beliefs are better, their beliefs are worse. Our people are better, their people are worse. You do that in order to have that political cohesion. And you have that, polit- you have that polit- politics in order to have that economic cohesion. You understand? And so, uh, so again, a political education would be how do you get that economic cohesion? Not, you know, oh yeah, there's LGBT and we have to we have to read more black women authors and we have to do more of this. And, you know, we have to have more black men and more black men are victims. That's not what political education is. That's just nonsense, really. What you want to do is you want to explain, uh, uh, you want to give an economic situation and have people be in defense of it. So a political education, for instance, for a French person is how to defend imperialism. Is the, is the good of the imperialism. You understand? The good of imperialism, the good of French markets, the good of French market capitalism, the good of... That's a political education. You understand? Because now that French person goes to that school or even the African person goes to that school and they say, yeah, capitalism is the best. I had, in fact, when I was doing that capitalist, uh, communist... It was like a capitalism versus socialist conversation. I thought it was a stupid... Con- I told them it was dumb. I didn't say dumb, but I told them, hey, look, you're black people, so... You don't own the means of production. You don't own capital. So a conversation on capitalism or socialism doesn't make any sense because you don't have any capital. But there was this one black guy in there who was just so in defense of. It's like, yeah, I want my freedom. Why are you taxing me? I don't want tax. I want low taxes. He went through a political education because he's verily defending the economy that he's in. You know, and I understand, hey, look, you know, if you're talking about socialism, you might be defending an economy, but you're not defending an economy that you're in. You're kind of just attacking an economy that you're not in. But again, you, it's not a viable economy and it's not going to work out for you. And not just that, again, you're in a totally different nation than you should be. If you're like an American socialist, you, you know, and you're an African-American or, or African in America, 
you know, you're not going to at 14 percent of the population and two percent of the wealth uh, beat the uh, 50 percent, you know, and 98 percent of the wealth uh, at anything. You know, uh, you're, you're not. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, yeah, so that's that's the thing I wanted to just point out. I just I just I sometimes I just want to tell you guys things. You know, it takes up a little bit of your time, but I, I'm glad that you have the patience with me. I just want to tell you things so that we can, like, as my book is delayed, if I even make another book. You know, even if I don't make another book, I want you to think about these things so that in your life you can do these things. You know, like 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 the guy from uh, the guy who passes away in 1794, he doesn't see the end of the French Revolution. You know. But he's like, look, I, I'm going to make this big effort. I'm going to translate this book. I'm going to gonna give you guys this book so that we can, uh, if anything, have that free, that, like have something. I want to give you something, you know? And thank you for, you know, taking it. All right. So uh, book four of System Blah 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 is concerned mapping out C. Smith as the different theories of political economy. Those theories, he reminds us, have had a considerable influence not only Upon and by the way, just to, just to let you know, yeah, it's okay to have a library. Uh, it's okay to have a library. Um, no, nothing against a library. Uh, we know who some of his targets were in this section too. Uh, one was Sir James Stewart's inquiry into the principle of political economy uh, in 1767. About that, Smith wrote to William Pulte on. Uh, Pulteney on 3rd September 1772 while he was composing Wealth of Nations that without once mentioning the man of his book uh, or his book I flatter myself that every false principle in it will meet with a clear and distinct confutation in mine so basically he says basically this guy writes this book in 1767 and by 1772 so by five years later he's like yo I'm gonna I'm gonna tear apart all of his false like everything that he said that was false to me you know that's good. Like, I I can't see that happening with my work, not just because I like my work and I don't think it has that many errors in it, but uh, also because like people don't care that much about other people's works. Or people don't care that much about my work. I'll say that. Oh, but even so, you know, here's the thing with, uh, here's the thing I want to say, because I kind of do that with regards to, uh, like, in the Book of Power, I do kind of, like, there's like a few examples where I'm kind of critical of other people's works. Uh are like very critical of other people's works, uh, not like line by line or whatever, but you know, it's, it's for a better cause because essentially a lot of quote unquote, like first, I'll tell you this in fact, I'll tell you this. So I'm having this conversation uh, earlier today and somebody says, yeah, this blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, the thing with that is that this person says X, Y, Z, right? And they're like, so you're saying that they were mistaken or you're saying that they were confused. It's like, yeah, it's possible. Like, like, the thing is that we can't go by this assumption that just because somebody's learned or intelligent or smart or even sounds good, just because doesn't mean that they're not wrong or, like, just very wrong. You know? Like, like, like I said, I, again, one of, the things that, one of the themes that we tend to confuse, is, again, is that culture first versus economics first, right? And it's like, you can't have culture first. You know, you can't. And, and, and this is the thing that even the Marxists understand. Like, they're like, no, 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 we got to change this economy. Like, everything comes from, everything is derived and de like from the economy. This is the thing that, that, that pissed off most people was this idea that, uh, like, that these, these white Marxists or these white, you know, yeah, these white socialists would always say, forget your cultural concern, forget your social concern, forget your political concern, and let's get rid of this econ economic order. And the reality is that they were right. You know? It, it's, it's that they were right for themselves, mainly. Right? You, on the other hand, don't even belong here. I mean, they don't belong here either, but they fought for the land. You don't belong here. Or you don't belong among them. That's the that's difference. You know, so, so if you're like, hey, no, why you make culture, blah, blah, blah. No, you just don't belong. That's it. Uh, like, like that, that was just pretty much it. But, but, but yeah, if you're existing in another person's economic order, then you're always going to be subservient to them. You know? Like, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no alternative. You know, there's no real alternative. You'll always be subservient to people who you're economically beholden to. You know? 
It's like he who feeds you controls you. You know what I'm saying? Like I could teach you everything on the planet. Uh, not literally, obviously. But if I'm not feeding you, you're still going to be loyal to whoever feeds you. You know what I mean? Anyway. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, these scholars, would, that's what they do. So anyway, uh, he's like, sovereign states. He says this, this, so on and so forth. So he goes to uh, refute the other person. And like, I'm not saying to try to refute me because that's not like the best thing in the world. But uh, I do think that, uh, like, I, like, 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 like it would, like, like, it's just like, we're again, we're in a different, like, it's a different, it's a different zone altogether. Because even this guy, I don't know who this Sir James Stewart is. Uh, sounds like he has an interesting book. But it's like Smith, like the guy's not even a person, per se. You get what I'm saying? Like he's, 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 he's not even like, who cares? And Smith still said, yeah, I'm going to write a book in refutation of his. You know, or I'm going to include refutations to him. Whereas, you know, if anybody writes a book today, it has nothing to do with my book. And my book, like my book did have something to do with other people's work. So I'll give myself some credit, right? But like, you, you know, you won't, you won't, you won't really find uh, my name in any of these scholarly work. And you won't even find a lot of other people, a lot of our contemporaries, you know? What I did, like, 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 I'll give my, like, I, I'm going to give myself some credit. I'm going to give it to Because in the pro-black compendium, right, I did point out Asara, like, I did praise Asara Hemotep and Adi Rafa. Like, I purposely put in the names of living people, uh, to say that, hey, if you're interested in learning more about African consciousness, because I was a part of a Tumblr community at that time, so I did say, if you're interested in learning more about African consciousness, here are some people. Or, or I did put in some quotes of people, I think that's what it was, because I think I did that on the website. But for the book, I put in some quotes of people, and so you'll see in the bibliography that these people come up, and if you want, I'll try to, I'll try to show you, you know, because I mean, a lot of people didn't even get that book, which was like I said, a lot of things is is not like it's not you're not too excited about <laughs> about uh, well well the, th the thing about the pro black campaign was that I didn't put too much labor into it you know so it's not like it's the end of the world for me uh, but um, I you know again it, it's like when you look at, when you compare it to what what these white boys are doing you know like the fact that Smith like that's actually like uh, some of us just read over it like oh who cares right. But the fact that Smith would, uh, the fact that Smith would, uh, oh yeah, here, I got a contemporary authors. The fact that Smith would give you, uh, uh, here, I'll show you guys. The fact that Smith would give you, um, like, let's a contemporary and, and debate about them, right, is actually pretty impressive. You know, so like I said, I did this pro black compendium, but I said these were contemporary authors. Now, unfortunately, I guess Joseph Benakini was already passed away, right? Marimba Ani, though, I give her some praise. Robin Walker, I definitely give this brother some praise. Francis Cress Welsing, she was still living. Runoka Rashidi, he was still living. I put in Queen Afua, Lila Africa. Ai Kwe Arma, he's still living, obviously. I mean, I mean he's alive right now. Asada Shakar and Adi Rafo. So I, I put them in the, in the, uh, contemporary authors, you know, as to say that these are the people you want to check out, you know, um, and that's like, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to big up the people who are living right now, you know, uh, while they're living, you know, a lot of people gave more respect to Renoko. Like, like, this is what they do. This is what we do. We just give people more respect after they pass, which is, it is a really backward way of, of going about in this world. But you know, it is what it is. Um, oh, Lila Africa actually passed away recently. But, of course, I tried to do... And this is the thing that you probably didn't pick up on, but I tried to do five... It was ten people, so I put five women and five men, you know? So this is a guy, uh, lady, man, lady, man, lady, man, lady, man, lady, man, lady. You know what I mean? So it, it kind of it's kind of also all over the place, but I tried to put some balance. But then, like I said, I also put a, a sar... Like, because like, I, I used one of his quotes... So Asar Imhotep, let me see if I could find it. So right here, oh, see, uh, this is the bibliography. So that's the bibliography. So I put, I, I explained to everybody who was in the book. So Alton Maddox, he's, uh, he was the guy in my United African Movement, the chairman, right? Uh, 
And then here's a sign of a tap. A meticulous researching the cultural, linguistic, and philosophical link between Comet and contemporary Bantu cultures in Central and Southern Africa. He has lots of free content, but also sells books. Oh, Brother G, he wrote the Memnon series. And so these people, like, put some, like, earlier I have these quotes. So Asari, oh, Asari Motep had this quote, which is actually pretty interesting. So the priesthood of Kemet are not dead. They simply have new names. One can go to Arusha in Kenya right now and find elder women writing Meru Nature in the sand. In certain priesthoods in West Africa, after a certain amount of years, you learn the fundamentals of Meru Nature, right? So uh, that's actually pretty interesting, if you guys don't know, that there are certain priesthoods in Western Africa today where you could learn the fundamentals of Meru Nature. And I think that might be the only quote I have of him, yeah. But it's still, like, you still just put him in the book. Uh, Brother G, who's the author of Memnon, let's just see. Uh, that's, like, that's like a fictional account. And there's this other brother I put in. Uh, his name is Ramesus. I just met the guy at a, hot- at a, at a uh, almost at a hotel, right? <laughs> no, I met him at a, a Marcus Garvey rally. And he was just a random guy walking around. And so I just, like, he told me something that was pretty deep. And I just put his name in the book, you know? But that's what you're supposed to do. Covet no land or riches that the supreme being does not naturally grant you. That was Brother G. He said that. He says, seek to be a part of a brotherhood, sisterhood, or group where we accomplish more together than alone and have no tolerance for evil and injustice so that you will forever be known as blameless. Uh, and then just to just to finish that off, let me say Ramesus. Ramesus gave me some advice. But I, I just asked him as an elder. Uh, he has a radio program, too. But I just asked him as an elder. Uh, I said... A radio host in America, an active UNI AACL member. He sells homemade Pan-African flags. Actually, if you guys paid attention to my flag in the background, that's what he does. And, and that's what he made. And he calls mass-produced Pan-African flags Chinese flags. So if you have like one of those flags that are produced by Chinese people, he would call it a Chinese flag because he makes his own flags. And if you notice some of my podcasts, I have a flag in the background. That's, uh, that's what Ramesus made. But yeah, his, his, what he told me was, a person who puts the interest of the individual before the interest of the group can be bought get rid of them, you know? And that's also very important, you know? It's just this idea that if you have, like, like yeah, and I, I put it in the sociology section. Anyway, but uh, actually right underneath that, Medonetra, uh, sorry, I'm going to type. Uh, but yeah, you get it. Um, yeah, you get it. Sorry, that was a big tangent, but uh, let's get back into the literature. It's, a, it's an interesting book, I'm telling you. But I, like I said, like, like, now, of course, I'm not refuting anybody in this book. This was a really positive book. So I didn't really refute anybody, per se. But, uh, you know, like the fact that Adam Smith is like, hey, you know, I'm not going to say this guy's name, but I'm going to write a book and, you know, handle his ideas because, like, that's what you're supposed to do. Like, that's what academics really do. Even in the academy today, we, they, they wrestle with other people's ideas and, like, try to advance them and push them forward or push the narrative or change the narrative or expand the narrative, whatever it is. But they, they do that. And, and that's something that, like, we don't do enough of, you know? Uh, so that's also, uh, I just wanted to do that. It's a little tangent, but, you know, I, I didn't realize that I, I did, uh, I, I, I get some credit for that. Come on. I get some credit for that. And if you don't have that book, go get it. Um, go get it. I, I do advise people to read the Book of Power. I would say if you feel like you're not ready, then read the Pro-Black Compendium first, and then you'll be ready. Um, but all right, let's keep going. Um, about that, Smith wrote to William Putney. Oh, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, I flatter, blah, 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 false prints in it. It is also in book four that the most well-known of Smith's passages on the working of an invisible hand is to be found. Smith wrote, every individual is continually exerting himself to find out the most advantageous employment for whatever capital he can command. It is his own advantage indeed, and not that of society, which he has in view. But the study of his own advantage naturally or rather necessarily leads him to prefer that employment which is the most advantageous to the society he intends only his own gain and he is in this as in many other cases led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention right so that's also uh that's also there uh it reminds me of this uh this lady uh, this lady she's like <laughs> full time well you know <sighs> So, so this other brother told me that, all right, wait, long story short, what, what happens is this lady is doing art, and her art is just, like, I guess, obese bodies, you know, like, close-ups of obese bodies, and she's like, I'm having such a bad, hard time selling my art, uh, can you guys come over to my website and support my art? And it's like, this is what, like, quote-unquote, invisible hand is, it's like, 
if you're having tr- like this is why pe- like this is like I think I would say like the perfect argument against socialism, right? I might actually put it in the funny, although people might misinterpret it as like fat shaming because it's not fat shaming. It's just you know if it's not selling, then you should change your product. You get what I'm saying? Like if the market's not open to your portraits, not portraits, but your drawings of just like obese naked bodies, right? Then just change your art. You know? It's it's like but but the thing with the socialists is that, you know, technically it's like, oh no, you know, this person should be compensated for uh for their art, notwithstanding how bad it is. Now it might not be the case. Again, like I said, the communism realistically speaking is to say that if you have an economy that can overproduce food, then this person should still eat, notwithstanding the fact that they're enjoying their own art. Like if they're not the fact the fact that they're doing their own artwork, but again, you know, the complication becomes, well, what if they're using up all the resources to make this stupid art? You know, like what if you're in a society where somebody is like, hey, I want to put this artwork on every building. I want to use up all the printing paper. I want to I want to print up a thousand or ten thousand copies of this stupid art and put it on ten thousand walls as an artistic expression. Right. At no cost to them. It's like, yeah, that's that's like what? You know what I mean? Like, again, you you would, you know, it does beg to like it does lean toward the authoritarian where it says, you know what? No, you're not going to do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, no, you know, uh, but but and, and, and you might say, well, no, it could just be that you could just draw whatever. But it's like, why are resources? Why are public resources being wasted on your inclination to just draw you know, obese people, or even like if you're, if you want your computer to run, you know, 10,000 games at once or something, like, you know, or like you want to build an arcade, you want an arcade in your backyard, you know what I mean? You want an arcade in your backyard, and then somebody else, your neighbor wants an arcade in their backyard, and your other neighbor wants an arcade in your backyard, and none of you, and you guys really want to play games together, like you guys mostly play games together, but you all have your own private arcades, you know, Uh, where does it stop? You know, there's, there's a, you know, like for realism, like for realism, you know, you would, uh, like you would have to then go on to like they say, like the socialism would be central planning, which would be, oh, we're gonna put an arcade over here, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, capitalism, where it's like, well, if you happen to be able to afford an arcade, sure, you can have an arcade. You know what I mean? And how you'd afford an arcade, obviously, you'd probably go exploit people in Africa or something, but, uh, but you know, but you can afford it. And therefore, there's like a social consequence for you and your stupid decision. Uh, but of course, you know, the exploitation part is where we don't, where we as African people are like, wait, what is that? You know, it sounds terrible. All right. <laughs> yeah, I could have been a comedian, right? No? Okay. Tough crap. All right. Uh, he intends his own gain. Yeah, so anyway. So while Smith is a critical of governmental protectionist policies of the mercantilist system and advocates free trade in that context, he also set limits to those freedoms and identity identifies duties for those who govern. So again, remember, like like again, like I said, like these these capitalist and pro-capitalist black people, for whatever reason, are like, Yeah, I don't want taxes, I don't want taxation. And the thing is that I could see from the table of contents that this guy is advocating for taxes. You know, taxes don't make a country socialist or capitalist. It's just like, like, cause what he says is that you know, uh, like actually, I could probably see the show the table of contents uh, just really quickly. Uh, well, just that part of the table of contents. But he says taxes upon rent. No, no, of the funds or sources of revenue which may peculiarly belong to the sovereign or, or commonwealth, of the sources of general and public revenue for the society. Of the expenses of supporting the dignity of the sovereignty, so that's the dignity of the sovereignty. Of the expenses of institutions for the education of youth, of the expenses for the ed, for the instruct institutions for the instructions of people of all ages, so that's the universities. Of the expenses of public works and public institutions, expenses of defense, expenses of justice, expenses of the sovereign, of the revenue of the sovereign, uh, uh public works institutions of facilitating the commerce of the society. You know, so basically the the uh, sovereigns, if you will, would finance the public works, the defense, the justice. You know, you wouldn't leave it up to the capitalists to provide the defense of the community. You know, you wouldn't leave it up to the capitalists to provide the justice of the community. So what you would have inside of, an eco- uh, of a system with no taxes is that you would have 
like justice and and defense and all those sort of stuff will be financed by the uh, uh, by the by the uh, by the private corporations themselves. Now, some people might say there are some sort of there are so, there are certain economies that are like that. Uh, example being like I want to say Samsung in Korea, uh, possibly. But beyond that, you know, like the point is that that's not the model that even uh, Anna Smith was advocating for. So, so you could have. So again, you know, uh, and just to just to clarify to people, uh, capitalism versus com versus socialism is one of them is to say that uh, the private ownership of, of 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 capital, right, versus the public ownership of capital. You know, the private ownership of capital versus the public ownership of capital. Uh, as to say that you know that forest or the mine would be owned by the government in in, in, in socialism as opposed to by an individual or a corporation in capitalism, right? Uh, all right, so anyway, so uh, let's just go back to this. So uh, while Smith is critical of government protectionist policies, and of course, you know, I just want to be clarified too that pretty much the government always owns these things. It's, it's just that the government would uh, give it to a, a corporation. Um, anyway, so in the fifth and final book of the Revenue of the Sovereign of the Commonwealth, Smith says that he will differentiate between those expenses which ought to be defrayed by the general contribution of the whole society, that's the government, right, and those which ought to be defrayed by though that of some particular part only, right? So again, like you want roads, you know, should that be by the government making the roads or should it be by the corporation that is used, that is mainly using those roads, you know? Because look, if it's, a, if it's the corporation that's mainly using those roads, then other corporations can't use those roads. You know, or other people can't use those roads because it's a private road. You know, kind of like your garage. If you have a garage, it's a private garage. It's not a public road, right? Uh, now, if you had a private garage that extended across the city, right, then would that be a public road or a private road? You know, uh, and again, it depends on where it's going to. If it's going towards the, the seaport, you know, there's other things to do with the seaport besides from whatever your business is. So you probably would say that's a, that's a public expense. And again, these are the questions that you'd want to bring back into Africa. And the questions that we didn't really bring back to Africa. I'll have to check on Nyere. I'll have to check on Nkrumah. I'll have to read them in debt. But as far as I understand, like as far as what I know, and this is, the, this is the thing, again, here's the important thing. I don't have to know them to talk about Pan-Africanism. You know, that's, that's, that's a problem. You know, I'm not to say that everybody has to know everything in order to talk about something, but, you know, they're not even that popular in the Pan-African canon. And that's, that's a problem. Because they may be the most critical people to follow. Although, I want you guys, like I said, you go check out the Discord if you're not on the Discord. Uh, this brother, Big Osiris, he, put, he showed us what Nkrumah's grandchildren looked like. And yeah, no, I don't like misogynists. Like, what he did to his family was wrong. What he did to his bloodline was wrong. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I'm saying that. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I don't get in too much trouble. But, but yeah, it's not, it's not what you're supposed to do. Uh, you, you know, like, like miscegenation is not good. Uh, so Garvey was right. And, of course, Nkrumah was purposely against Garvey for some reason. Um, uh, well, not for some reason, but you guys get it. Um, so ought to be defrayed by that in particular part only. Here, Smith enumerates and assesses the different methods whereby the whole society may be made to contribute towards the expenses incumbent on the whole society. Modern tax theory begins here. Finally, see, like, he begins tax theory. You can't say that he's dismissive of tax when he begins tax theory. I'm actually going to make a little note in my book. Uh, like, you know, I'm just going to flip the, you know, like the edge in order that I remember to search that next time some idiot. But of course, I don't really talk to too many idiots. So, you know, and thanks to you guys, because uh, you guys are smart. I like that. You know, I like that I'm surrounded by smart people. That, that's really the thing. So I appreciate that. Just make sure you send me some comments. I love, I like, that's what I appreciate the most. All right. Uh, also, those of you who don't know, I got a cash app. I actually appreciate that too. I appreciate it. And, and if you don't have my book, please get the books. Even get Zubiri. Like, that's the one I really wanted to be the bestseller. You know? Small, tiny, nice little book. Uh, anyway, modern tax theory begins here. Finally, Smith aims to examine the reasons and causes which have induced almost all modern governments to mortgage some part of their revenue or to contract debts 
and that's and what has been the effects of those debts upon real wealth, the annual produce of the land and labor of the society. It's actually a pretty important question, you know. Well, I'm pro- I'm printing I'm publishing this on uh, I'm I'm recording this on the sixth of the October, but America is actually supposed to in a few weeks, so it probably already passed by now, uh, decide on whether it's going to default on its on its loans. You know what I mean? Uh, you know better than me. But yeah, it's like the modern, like the federal debt theory, he goes into that as well. Or the national debt theory, he goes into that as well. So Smith's contemporaries marveled at the systematic nature of the wealth of nations and saw in it the commercial code of nations. It is not surprising that even today, economic, economists continue to see Smith as the starting point of their discipline, for their discipline. But Smith's system plan, systemic systematic plan is not sufficient to account for the longevity and breadth of the work's appeal. Certainly not every student who comes to the Wealth of the Nation will read through the entire volume from cover to cover. Thankfully, Smith's individual books and even chapters within those books are designed as standalone sections. Readers can pick and choose, dipping in and ducking out where so inclined. What most often remains with readers of Wealth of the Nations, his contemporaries and ours, both academics and general readers alike, are Smith's poignant examples and maxims. Smith's realistic description of the pin factory, for example, with which the Wealth of the Nation begins. The, oh yeah, the pins, yeah, so he's talking about pins, you know. So, like, to make a pin by itself might take a lot of labor from an individual, but if a, a group can, you know, subdivide the work, and overproduce the pins. And that's that's something really important. For instance, which was the Will the Nation Begins, the elegant simplicity of Smith's phrases, such as the natural system of perfect liberty and justice, quotable lines that stick in one's mind, such as man is of all sorts of luggage, the most difficult to be transported, the power of its adages, such that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests, his abundant illustrations drawn from the nooks and crannies of daily life. This is what made Smith a bestseller in the 18th century and is also why Wealth of Nations remains a classic of world literature to usually, to be usually usefully enjoyed by readers today. And like I said, this was Mark Spencer from Brock University in Canada. Um, and yeah, don't forget that Canada's wealth is really comes from like comes from like I said, the resource extraction in Africa. Like it's it's one of the biggest mining nations on the planet. Uh, so you know, even though they practice a social democracy in this welfare state, and of course, if you read uh, Neocolonialism: The Last Stage of Imperialism by Kwame Nkrumah, that's what he's talking about: how the West is going into this new this welfare state, this social democracy, and this is the thing that Lenin is warning against. But uh, you know, that's the end of the book. So I appreciate you guys sticking with me. You see the open secret. I don't know if I was as actively pointing out, hey, this is the open secret as I used to, as I did in the other series, but um, this is the end. So I appreciate you sticking through with me. I hope you're enjoying your day. I hope I'm enjoying my day, you know? Um, but this is where we are, you know? And this is what they are doing versus what we're doing. You know, uh, at least in this section, we talked about him looking at the Roman imperial style. At least we we, we did a, a bunch of all this stuff. But, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us, the more I see it, right, for us to be about our economic independence, to be about our own way of surviving and thriving independently from other people and the task is falling on us you know if i don't do it i i want you to do it all right i really want you to say to yourself this is something i want to get done anyway it's 8 40 right now i'm going to be on a revolution matron show at 10 o'clock uh if you haven't heard it yet then please go over there and hear it if you leave a comment on her page, subscribe to her page. This is a great sister. By the way, I forgot to tell you. So if you wanted to get a T-shirt, she set it up so that you can get a T-shirt. So if you want a pro-black perspective T-shirt, like be my guest and go over to that site linked in the description below and get, your, like, get yourself wearing something that says, hey, you know what? I, I listen to some good podcasts, you know? But outside of that, you get these books, you get the t-shirts, 
and and you just you subscribe and you support everybody harsh reality podcast bit of medicine podcast learning curve and whoever else is out there you know you do that and and you'll and you'll get that but you know i hope you're doing well all right i hope you're doing well and i thank you for your time it's been amazing please leave me a comment and shemiam hotep uncle ja senebneb amen maat do our nature.